Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When children are growing up, one of the things that parents hopefully attempt to instill within their children is an attitude of humility. In most circles, someone who obviously thinks very, very highly of themselves is not oftentimes received very well. If you've ever been around somebody like that, it can grow tiresome and weary. You can see it play out in the wider culture as well as people reject this bravado of importance and things of that nature that seem to come out in our political realms, our celebrity realms, those types of places, and one does grow weary of such things. If you have to tell somebody how good you are, that might be a clue that you're not actually that good at it. If you have to tell somebody how amazing you are, you might not be that amazing. I seek to work under the premise and instill within those close to me that it is much more effective to show somebody these realities than to tell them about it. What we oftentimes fall into, though, in many of our own circles, is not a over presentation of ourselves as we are so good in various ways, but rather that we see humility and a lack of confidence as equivalent. We see and hear humility saying, I shouldn't have any type of confidence. And today I want us to consider that is a, a misunderstanding of what humility actually is. And I'd like to start in our gospel lesson today, Mark chapter 9. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at uh, some surrounding texts of Mark chapter 9. So if you want to get a Bible out and turn to Mark 9, beginning in verse 33, I'll read that again. This was part of our gospel reading today. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Here in the gospel narrative, we see the issue of a lack of humility. The disciples were arguing with one another who was the greatest. And at least here in this text, there is a, a sense of they probably had at least an inkling that this wasn't something that they should be arguing about as Jesus kind of confronts them and they, and they kind of uh, withdraw a little bit and they don't want to talk about it. But over the next, the remainder of chapter 9 and into chapter 10, the theme of humility is going to come up over and over and over again. Who is the greatest is going to be something that is continually an issue for not only the people 
around Jesus, but his disciples and everybody who is a part of his ministry. When we look at the text, I'll invite you now to open up your Bibles. You see here a, uh, uh, the text with who is the greatest. And then we, we get another narrative. We get another narrative immediately following. And this narrative deals with Jesus' disciples identify other people who are casting out unclean spirits in the name of Christ. And they want Jesus to stop them. They want Jesus to to, to make them stop. And Jesus doesn't do that. And you might be thinking, how, how does that have to do with humility and, and, and whatnot? But the reality is that as people navigate the world, I have found that the ones, that people who are most threatened by those around them, oftentimes are those who are most puffed up with their own self-worth and own self-importance. And so here, the disciples say, who is the greatest? Talking about the disciples. And then we move right into a story of the people, of somebody else doing something good, right? Wouldn't they desire unclean spirits to be cast out wouldn't they desire people to be talking about Jesus's name and they say whoa 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 whoa! stop them stop them from doing that that's my job that's what we're supposed to be doing that's what I'm all about after all I'm in the conversation of who is the greatest but it doesn't stop there with the topic of humility there's a connection of course with temptation and things beginning in verse 42 whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea and what we're going to see here is jesus is continually going back and forth from disciples to children, those who are doing quote-unquote great things to those who bring nothing to the table. And he, oh, he repeatedly, time and time and time again, will point to the one who brings nothing to the table as a true follower of Jesus Christ. You need to be like this child. You need to be like these little ones. In fact, be very careful that you don't cause one of these little ones to sin for it would be better for you to have a millstone put around your neck and cast into the sea. We get this back and forth. We here get a warning to those disciples and to those who would hear. And we move into conversation about divorce. The Pharisees ask him some questions, one of them dealing with the topic of divorce. Here Jesus says to them and makes a reference to, a, to something, and Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote to you this commandment. Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote to you this commandment. This word that is translated hardness of heart is literally translated uncircumcised in heart and ears. And it means to be obstinate, to be stubborn, to be completely unyielding. What does that sound like? That sounds like the opposite of humility. That is the opposite of one's position toward God and towards those around them. And if you've ever been around the topic of divorce, 
the issue of divorce, you will know that pride and a lack of humility are something that will always be a part of that reality. I'm right, you're wrong, do it my way or else. This continues to be a challenge for all of us, divorced or not divorced. The issue of humility comes into play in every area of our life. In 1013, again, what do we have here? Another reference to Jesus going and pointing to children. Let the little children come to me. The disciples are seeking to keep the little children away from Jesus because they're not important. They are, they are inconsequential. They should just back up. Jesus is very important. We have a very important person around. He cannot be bothered. And Jesus says, let the little children come to me. Disciples are working from a, a, a position of, of pride and importance and thinking uh, they are of immense amount of value and they have somebody that they need to protect and keep others away from rather than inviting them in. In 10.17, as we continue to look briefly at each of these different sections of the narrative, we have the rich man who comes to Jesus and he asks him this, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This rich man comes to him wanting to tell Jesus all that he has done to keep the law of God. He wants to go through the commandments and say, I have done this. I am successful at this. I am, I am following God's law just like I was taught to, just like I am supposed to. And then Jesus calls him out and finds the chink in the armor and he identifies that it's all built on a house of cards. lack one thing. Sell all you have and come and follow me. And he leaves disappointed. He leaves crushed. You mean I have to give it all up? Everything? Jesus this is piercing arrow goes right through his pride, right through it, and he simply leaves. 10.32, Jesus is going to talk about his death again. The ultimate act of humility by Jesus is to offer himself up in the most gruesome death available. Death upon a cross. 10.35. Remember how the disciples weren't talking about who is the greatest? In 10.35, we have James and we have John who come to talk to Jesus. And they want to be one on his left and one on his right. And Jesus says, this is not for me to grant. And the reality is they don't even understand what they're asking for. But again, it comes from a position of pride. Self-importance. I want to be elevated to a position of power. Throughout this entire section... The only ones who receive a, 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 an okay or a, a kind of a good word are the little children who really offer no words. They're simply used as an example 
not purely as an example. Jesus desires the little children to come to them, but there is no one making a good confession throughout this entire thing. The disciples want to be the greatest. The rich man desires to show how good he is. This is a theme that runs through these sections, these chapters, and it's not until chapter 10, verse 46, that anyone receives a positive word from Jesus in the sense of a response to their position towards Christ. And it's only one who has nothing to offer. The blind man. The blind man who cries out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy. He is a beggar. He is of zero societal worth. And his cry is simply, Lord, have mercy. He is an example of the correct demeanor towards Jesus. The words from the epistle of James unpack a little bit of what I have laid out from our gospel text. Here again from James chapter 4, verse 5 and following. Or do you suppose it is is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace, Therefore, to say God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep, Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Godly humility doesn't mean a lack of confidence. Godly humility means having confidence in the right thing. Some of the most humble people that I know, that I work with, that I engage with, are some of the most confident individuals on the face of the planet. Not because they think of themselves as important, as worthy, but rather because their confidence is, some, is in something other than themselves. Their confidence is not in their own righteousness, their own worthiness, their own intelligence, their own whatever it might be, skills, abilities, success in life. Their confidence is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. It is very easy at times Maybe you're like, well, I don't really even have anything to be overly boastful about. I'll just sit over here. And, and sometimes the, 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 the pride that we have of ourselves is that, well, I'm not like them. I'm not like those people out there. I'm not like you fill in the blank. And so 
the pride is not even in something of ourselves. It's just that we are not somebody else or doing something else, and we find pride in that reality. But again, we've put the pride back into our own self. Our confidence is in, I'm not that, rather I'm something else. Rather than my confidence is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. True humility is grounded in a great amount of confidence. True humility is grounded in what God has done, what God will do. And when we forget that, we will quickly fall. But it doesn't mean that we need to identify ourselves as worthless because the one whom our confidence is, is in has said, you are worthy on my account. And I will exalt you because of what I have done for you. So what is it for you today? This is a sin that hits us all. There are, there are sins that the scriptures talk about and, and you might read them and you say, Whew, that, that, I, don't, I don't have to deal with that one. That's not really what I'm struggling with. The sin of pride hits every single one of us. What is it that you hang your hat on? What is it that you find yourself being confident about your standing before others, before God, before whomever? Our pride might not be in something great, as I said, maybe our pride is in that I'm not like those people. Our pride will always make us fall. This message is in no connection to things, but once again, the world of Christianity has seen a very influential leader fall flat on their face. Through sexual immorality. When we don't think we can fall, when we think we are immune to the things that are tempting us, be very careful. Pride is poison. And so whatever it is this morning for you, whatever that pride is built on for you today, I invite you to come and lay it before your Savior, Jesus Christ. With the simple cry of a child and of a blind man, Lord, have mercy upon me. And he does. He has mercy upon you. He forgives you. He renews you. And he will exalt you on account of his work, on account of of who he is. And that's the perfect place to be. Lord, have mercy upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we'll take an opportunity